<clears throat> I see the issue is I can't move the. <laughs> So I think we're we're live and we're good to go. Okay, so we're, we're starting. Okay. Um, well, uh, I am uh, really delighted um, to introduce one of the the clearest and most original uh, constitutional law uh, thinkers in Canada today, by my estimation. Um, Naomi Metallic is a uh, assistant professor at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie. Um, she holds the Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy. Um, I could I could talk about her for a long time, but she continues to practice law. She's been named the best lawyer in Canada um, in Aboriginal law since 2015. Um, been the top 25 most influential lawyers in the area of human rights, advocacy, and criminal law. She serves on numerous advisory boards and committees. Um, she's written and co-written groundbreaking reports on a variety of key topics um, to further Indigenous people's well-being and self-determination, um, from constitutional issues to policing to children's services, um, that connection between uh, constitutional and, and legislative reconciliation is, is a strong theme in all of her work. Um, and her ability to unpack and critique uh, current laws and policies, but also propose new ways forward is second to none. Um, I was I was saying to Naomi earlier, I'm always referring people to her work, so I was delighted to find uh, she has a B press and, and we'll find a way to put that up uh, so so people can access more of her work. So um, I'll, I'll turn it, with that, I'll turn that over to you, Naomi, um, and look forward to your remarks. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Hadley, for that really uh, kind and wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you so much for the organizers for, for having me. I'll say, well, Dasi, Begisin, like Sidbug. It's very early where many of you are in, in Alberta. Here it's 11.30, so we're getting closer to noon. But Sidbug means morning, so it's also morning for all of us across the country. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just delighted to be with you and to talk to you about a subject that I think I've been uh, haranguing my Aboriginal law students about, but they're writing their exam in about a half an hour. And uh, anyway, this is a topic that has come up in lots of class discussion. Um, and when I was asked to, to give this presentation and reflecting on um, the conference uh, theme and also the questions that were posed, what has patriation made possible, what issues and conflicts remain, I was inspired to talk about this phrase that I've been thinking about more and more, which as an, and Hadley mentioned it, legislative reconciliation. And I'm not sure if this is a new phrase, my, uh, my copyright application is pending, uh, but no, um, Basically, what I mean by this is um, I'm talking about governments using their legislative powers to protect and accommodate Indigenous people's rights, um, and I would say that in, in a broad sense, rather than uh, using their legislative powers for ill, to exploit and to infringe. Um, and obviously, when I, I say that, I, I mean that this process has to include collaboration with Indigenous peoples in the development of such legislation. Um, Justice Binney had a phrase that he used in the Mikasu 2005 case, which said unilateral accommodation is the antithesis of reconciliation. So that has to go along with it. And I, I'm going to speak more to that issue um, of the, the uh, involvement and collaboration and cooperation of Indigenous peoples in this idea uh, as we get further along. So I guess my thinking is, is that with the entrenchment of Section 35 of the Constitution, we should have a culture of legislative reconciliation. And, um, and I think this is what constitutionalism means or should mean in this context. And so I've got this quote up here on the screen. Uh, it comes from a great article by Stephen Cornell, which is about indigenous constitutionalism, uh, but about constitutionalism more generally. I assign it to my con law students at the beginning of every year because it's so it's such a great explanation of what constitutions are, both written and unwritten, and what constitutionalism is. And um, you know, the, the main point that I want to get out here is that he talks about constitutionalism being, you know, at the heart of it. Um, the, the rules, uh, the foundational rules and laws 
um, that a government holds itself to, and that this is not just uh, you know in um, uh, just um, by the fact that this is written down, but there's actually much more to it. It's actually living those constitutional values and principles. So uh, he says constitutionalism includes uh, this idea that this higher law embodied in a constitution has real power. It shapes how governments behave and what government does. Um, it compels compliance, not through force, but through perhaps unspoken agreement. There's a sort of a cultural understanding of what um, aspiring to the fundamental values in a constitution is supposed to be. Um, yeah, and, and so talking about it as a real sort of practical lived uh, part of who we are as a nation. And, um, you know, when I think of, you know, the Charter, for example, I think we have much more of a culture of constitutionalism when it comes to the Charter, right? Um, and we can give examples uh, of the fact that, you know, there is, there's actually a provision in the Department of Justice Act that requires uh, federal lawyers, whenever passing new laws, to review that law to ensure consistency with the Charter. There is no parallel responsibility when it comes to Section 35 rights. Um, and I think we can also point to examples of, you know, cases where there have been Charter decisions. I think of the, the various Charter challenges in the, two, in the 2000s around um, the rights to gay marriage and how eventually that led to the, the passing of uh, legislation on this and then there was a reference but nonetheless there was legislative action to address things that were happening in the courts. Um, so it really doesn't seem that we have much of a culture for this uh, in Canada around Aboriginal rights. In the U.S., in fact, there is a, quite a culture of this regarding tribal rights and John Burroughs has an excellent article on this um, where he talks about how, in fact, since about the mid-1960s, uh, the U.S. Congress has passed nearly or more than 40 pieces of significant legislation that address tribal rights to their, their sovereignty, self-government, funding issues around these. But yet we don't have a culture like this in Canada. We haven't had this for Aboriginal and treaty rights. So. For my talk this morning, I wanted to share with you where my thinking on this is so far. So the questions that I want to unpack um, are here. Oh, sorry, I've gone a little bit too far. Let me find my cursor. Um, there we go. The questions that I want to unpack with you are these. So what's happened and not happened since the entrenchment of Section 35? What explains the lack of legislative action? Why is the absence of legislation a problem? What are the potential barriers uh, to achieving legislative, uh, legislative reconciliation as a sort of a, a, a culture shift in Canada? And what perhaps are the pathways uh, that, can, that can take us to actually having such a culture? And some of these questions I have explored in um, other writings of mine, um, but it's particularly these last two questions that I've been preoccupied with a lot these days. Um, and I would say that the reason I've been thinking about it more is the fact that there has been some legislative efforts of late, particularly from the, uh, the federal government since about 2019. The Trudeau government has passed um, legislation on Indigenous child welfare, um, as well as uh, there's another bill recognizing Indigenous language rights and creating an Indigenous language commission. Um, there has been some provincial uh, movement, um, an interesting one here in Nova Scotia last week, a new law recognizing Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq language as fundamental to Nova Scotia and creating a working group to work with government to, to really implement uh, Mi'kmaq language recognition and respect was uh, 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 introduced for first reading a couple weeks ago in the legislature. Now, these changes for the most part, or these, these legislative steps forward are relatively modest. I would say the most gutsy of these uh, to date is this federal bill uh, on, uh, or federal law uh, on child well, indigenous child welfare. It's by no means perfect, um, but uh, it, it, it does some significant things. So we, we refer to this often as shorthand uh, Bill C-92, uh, when it was first introduced as a bill, but it, its long title is quite a mouthful, but it's something like uh, for, uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, um, Child and Family um, uh, Law. And so we're going to refer to it as Bill C-92 from here on out. But it does some important things that have 
were did um, have not been uh, used before by the federal government to advance indigenous uh, interests and rights. So one of these things that it does is it imposes minimum standards uh, to prevent where at all possible the severing of indigenous children's connections to their families, uh, communities and their culture that can result through the uh, the child welfare system. And in addition to that, or, or, or complementary to that, the law also empowers uh, indigenous self-government over areas of child and family services. Now, this did not just come out of an idea of Trudeau's government. This was uh, driven by a crisis and overrepresentation of indigenous children in the child welfare system dating back decades and a landmark Canadian human rights tribunal decision finding that Canada had contributed to this uh, crisis through the chronic underfunding of, um, of services uh, in communities, and this was found to be discriminatory. Um, so it took, obviously, advocacy and push to get this uh, bill uh, from uh, the government of Canada, or this law, I should say. And But it is uh, quite an important bill, and really the first that we've seen of its type. There's a similar bill in the U.S., uh, on uh, in tribal uh, child and family services that was passed in the mid 70s. So we're a little bit behind, but better late than never. Um, but even still out of the gate here, we've got the government of Canada aiming to have the law declared unconstitutional as being one beyond Canada's um, jurisdiction over indigenous peoples under section 9124 because of the impact that it will have uh, on uh, provincial autonomy. And uh, Quebec is also arguing that Canada cannot recognize and accommodate the inherent right to self-government because of uh, that for the last 30 years or so, governments in Canada have not recognized such rights by legislation. So Canada, uh, Quebec, and this is my uh, sort of summary of Quebec's argument, but Quebec is essentially trying to say that decades of legislative neglect have somehow hardened into a, future, a feature of our constitutional architecture. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it more the way they do in their, in, in their submissions, but they are saying that Aboriginal um, rights, specifically self-government, cannot be recognized through legislation, that it either has to um, be recognized in the courts uh, uh, come to through a tripartite agreement in which the provinces are involved, or we need a constitutional amendment, but there cannot be legislation. So um, luckily, the Quebec Court of Appeal rejected the vast majority of Quebec's arguments, and um, this case is now heading to the Supreme Court of Canada. We'll probably have a hearing in the winter of 2023. 20, uh, but the outcome of this case will have a major impact on whether this idea of legislative reconciliation can gain a stronger foothold in uh, Canadian law. And I, I personally think it's quite important that we, we get there. Um, so this has been prompting me to think a lot about what is needed in order to sustain and foster such, such a culture in Canada. So with that, that was sort of my intro, I'm going to jump into sort of covering off these questions. And hopefully we'll have some time for uh, discussion uh, at the end as well. So to first sort of just lay the, the groundwork, what has happened since 1982, since the entrenchment of Section uh, 35 in the Constitution Act? Um, we've pretty, as I've said before, federal, we've seen very little from the federal government in terms of uh, legislation to accommodate uh, to recognize or respect Aboriginal rights, at least up until 2019, uh, the examples I gave you earlier. Um, so, you know, the, the, the legislation that has existed in Canada with respect to Indigenous peoples for about 123 years, the only piece of legislation was the Indian Act, um, shockingly. The next piece of federal legislation, so the Indian Act was passed in 1876, and there were some antecedents to it before that, right, starting at, starting at Confederation. But the next piece of federal legislation on Indigenous issues generally only occurred in 1999, and that was the First Nations Land Management Act. Um, since that time, however, there has been more federal legislation between 1999 and 2018, but it's, I would count about 10 statutes, um, but they've all been 
focused on issues on about usually uh, reserve land or resources, uh, oil and gas revenues that relate to reserve land. So the legislation, I would say, is not this has not really been about accommodating Aboriginal rights. It's about addressing sometimes gaps in the Indian Act. There was a legislation on matrimonial property on reserve, but not about implementing Section 35. All of the sort of work that's happened since 1982 and even some of it beforehand has come in the form of federal policies and executive action. So we, after the Calder decision in 1973, we get Canada passing a policy saying that it is open to negotiating about land rights in the form of modern land claim agreements or um, in the form of what's called specific claims. Um, and that has been the, the document that's been used to negotiate some of the modern treaties that we find in Canada today. And in 1995, the federal government also passed the Inherent Rights Policy, which sets out the government's, uh, federal government's process for negotiating self-government agreements um, with uh, Indigenous groups. So all of these uh, re results in sort of individual arrangements uh, through these policies and they tend to be quite quite long in the making you know uh, some co uh, comprehensive uh, land claim agreements and self-government agreements can take decades to negotiate and it is a sort of a piecemeal group by group basis um yes and um I will come to, I think, a bit more of the critique of that a little bit later. Um, so uh, moving on then, I think the we would also say that there's been fairly limited provincial action in terms of uh, accommodation of Indigenous interests and rights. Um, the examples that I could give is that I've, I've done some work looking at language legislation. There are some provinces and territories that have you know, passed their own laws to accommodate the recognition to some extent of Indigenous languages. Some child welfare legislation in some provinces had some provisions to accommodate or recognize um, you know, cultural interests of Indigenous children. But it really varied across the board. Um, so what we get to, to a large extent is a fairly piecemeal sort of recognition and, and relatively modest, I would say. For the most part, all of the rights recognition seems to have been left to the courts. Right since 1982, uh, I was trying to count them this morning. Some words, upwards of 30 plus decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada on Aboriginal rights and title uh, treaty, as well as the duty to consult. Um, not so much recognition on self-government, which has been a major uh, criticism of the doc uh, the jurisprudence from the courts. But the court's role in um, defining Section 35 rights has sort of gotten to the point where in a 2020 decision called Washinuat, um, the Supreme Court said that uh, they, they actually say defining Section 35 rights is a task that has fallen largely to the courts. Um, and uh, we will uh, un unpack that a bit more in terms of some of the, the issues. Um, but... Uh, as far as leaving the interpretation of Section 35 uh, simply to the courts, I will note that this, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report from 2015 said that Section 35, as it is currently being interpreted, is not achieving meaningful reconciliation. Um, and uh, to turn the tide, the uh, TRC recommended that we need to adopt uh, UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as the framework for reconciliation across the board in this country. And I'll speak more about the UN Declaration further on. Um, so, so, we, so most of all of the work has been just happening at the courts. And um, a point that I wanted to make is even when we get to the courts and, and we are successful, um, we have seen major challenges as well in implementation of those decisions after the court, which would require um, either negotiated agreements or legislation. And uh, there, there, there are major challenges with that. Now, the Supreme Court has signaled in some of its decisions, not uh, in a really strong or heavy handed way, I would say more of a light touch, but they have signaled that governments can and should legislate 
in these areas. So in a decision called Cote from 1996, the court said, look, what we set down when we interpret Section 35 are just minimum standards. There is nothing preventing governments from, from exceeding those and, and, and addressing them. Uh, they said that in a couple of decisions, um, and, and Adams from 1996 and uh, the Marshall decision from 1999, the court, in the context of talking about infringement and justified infringement of Aboriginal rights, said that when legislation uh, does not accommodate or recognize um, Aboriginal rights and allows an unstructured discretionary regime, so allowing a minister to decide whether or not to recognize uh, an Aboriginal right um, without setting out parameters about how the right is supposed to be respected is in fact um, a, an infringement of Aboriginal rights. So that the governments must be thinking about that in accommodating Aboriginal rights. Uh, they've also in some of their duty to consult cases including Haida and Rio Tinto and more recently in Clyde River talk about uh, the fact that governments can also legislate to set out more clearly um, the duty to consult and how it will the government will approach it, the steps involving the, the process. But for the most part, this has all fallen on deaf ears. Um, and uh, instead, implementation, when it does occur, uh, tends to be left to executive action only. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen some repercussions of this. I mean, one that is sort of an ongoing dispute here in the Maritimes is the, what the Mi'kmaq say is a lack of implementation of the decision of the Supreme Court recognizing a moderate livelihood fishery in Marshall in 1999. And uh, attempts to negotiate around this issue have you know, been unsuccessful, and often it's a matter of government foot dragging, uh, at least for, from what I've heard. Um, and uh, there has not been any sort of legislative response to Marshall, even though that was something that the government uh, said, um, or the, I'm sorry, the court said that the governments can do in, in Marshall One. Recently, I presented to a group of uh, a, a Senate committee um, looking at uh, the housing crisis in First Nations, um, particularly that is, I think, exacerbated since since COVID, but there's been a housing crisis in First Nations for decades. Um, but it was interesting, I, I came uh, to, to the table to talk about this decision from 2006 from the Supreme Court called Sapir and Polchis, which recognized a right to harvest timber um, by the Mi'kmaq and the Wollastoe people of uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to harvest timber for personal use. And you know, the use of this right could actually go a far way to addressing the housing crisis um, in First Nations communities in the region. However, this, this right has essentially laid dormant because governments um, in uh, the region um, have not really taken any steps to attempt to implement that right. So moving on to sort of what's happened sort of since 1982, let's talk about, um, no, too far again. What explains this lack of legislative action? What can we, what can we attribute it to? So, I mean, I think we can, and so this is some different sort of speculation on this. I think part of it can be seen as a byproduct of the, the constitutional process about how Section 35 got included. Uh, I'm not going to get into the whole history of it, but, you know, it required, you know, Indigenous people were first very concerned. There was a case that went to the Privy Council in England about whether Canada could repatriate because there was a concern that Canada would renege on its treaty and constitutional uh, or royal proclamation obligations. Um, but the, the, they were assured by the Privy Council that Canada, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, was bound by the obligations that bound Great Britain. Um, and then after that, we get uh, communities lobbying for uh, inclusion of recognition of their rights within um, within the repatriated constitution and it gets put in, but then after provincial pushback gets taken out, it gets get put back in with the word existing, put put next to the words, the, uh, the existing Aboriginal um, and treaty rights are hereby affirmed. Uh, and this, the, the, uh, the, the view of this being that perhaps what was only, what was being recognized was simply just the status quo, which wasn't a real recognition or respect of Indigenous rights. 
Um, and I mean, so there was this debate since 1982 about what did um, Section 35 mean? Some people referring to it almost as an, as an empty box because um, no steps were taken to elaborate what was included as an Aboriginal right and what government's obligations were. And it's not as though Indigenous people weren't attempting to try to clarify that, but that sort of fell on deaf ears in, um, uh, you know, uh, at the time of confederation, um, of, I'm sorry, patriation, not confederation, uh, of patriation in 1982, um, the, uh, uh, it was essentially seen, uh, First Nations were told, look, there's not time to, uh, to specify uh, what all the rights are under Section 35. We'll have fur further future constitutional conferences where this will be fleshed out. But um, Indigenous people were largely less, were left out of the Meech Lake Accord, which, uh, thanks to Elijah Harper, um, resulted in you know the Meech Lake Accord not going ahead. And um, then we get the Charlottetown Accord, um, which you know I think perhaps more uh, to correct the problems or address the the issue with Meech Lake, perhaps rather than actually meaningfully trying to address and uh, recognize uh, Indigenous rights, there there was far more involvement of Indigenous peoples in, um, in the drafting of uh, the amendments that were proposed in Charlottetown that, uh, Charlottetown that would recognize significant rights around self-government. Um, however, um, as we know, uh, the, the, the nationwide referendum failed. And so you wonder if just by the time after Charlottetown, um, you know, we didn't really see uh, much, uh, I would say, meaningful um, government interest in defining Section 35 rights. There was through Charlottetown, but you wonder by the time that Charlottetown sort of ran out of steam, if the government just said, well, we tried, too bad, it's it's done, it's over. Um, so, um, you know, since this time, uh, perhaps there's a belief that, you know, in order to make have, have real meaningful action, we need a constitutional amendment. But per, if this was an idea that existed at the time, I think the, the definitions and the interpretation of Section 35 uh, since 1982 um, lead to a, a different conclusion. So, so lack of legislative action, I think, potentially is a byproduct of the constitutional negotiations, but there are other issues. Uh, constant uh, jurisdictional wrangling between the federal and provincial governments, uh, each trying to say that dealing with Indigenous issues is the other's responsibility. Um, so the, the province will say to the federal government, section, you have Section 9124, they're your responsibility, uh, not ours. And then um, the federal government will say, well, in many areas uh, that we're talking about, child welfare, for example, education, uh, administration of justice, that's actually more provincial. So it, it's your responsibility to address their issues in these areas. And so we've had this chronic uh, sort of hot potato um, dealing with Indigenous issues. And when we do deal with Indigenous issues, it's often in more of a very reactive way. Um, I'll speak more about division of powers issues shortly, but um, it seems that a lot of the emphasis, uh, I, you know, the, the court cases that have come from the Supreme Court in the last 30 to 40 years has actually found a significant amount of overlapping jurisdiction, and I'll speak more to that after. But it, it does seem that in all of this, the, the emphasis has been more on government powers rather than on government responsibilities with respect to respecting and accommodating Indigenous rights. Probably a really huge, uh, maybe the biggest issue um, that explains lack of legislative action is um, how the court defined um, Aboriginal rights, particularly in the decision of um, Vanderpeet. So first of all, let's just sort of situate this as being the approach being very different from how we approach uh, charter rights. So with charter rights, we, we say they exist, <laughs> and judicial interpretations tend to focus on whether a right has been engaged in a particular context, including issues related to their scope. Um, but then the question is whether government action has infringed that right, and whether it's reasonable or not. But that is not the starting point when it comes to Aboriginal rights, and, and what set the stage for this primarily is the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Vanderpeet which um, 
you know, states that, you know, indigenous rights have to be proven on a case by case basis. So Justice Chief Justice Lemaire at the time compared Aboriginal rights to charter rights and said that they were different because they were not universal. They were not in the universal liberalism tradition. Rather, they were specific rights to a specific subset of the Canadian population. And they were still constitutional rights, but not of the same variety. And so he emphasized a lot the aboriginalness of Aboriginal rights and uh, and said that it was based in these pre-contact cultures and required each particular group uh, to demonstrate a right on a case-by-case basis. Um, so, uh, so in, groups are required to go to court to prove a right. So we don't assume from the outset that these rights exist in a general way. They have to be proven. And I think even more importantly, they're, they're seen as being different from fundamental charter rights. They're not seen in the same vein as fundamental human rights. And um, in the way that the case law has developed over time, it puts a significant burden of proof on Aboriginal groups to um, prove very complex tests to have their rights uh, acknowledged in the courts. And in fact, I would say that the test is often so complex that rarely do we even get to a discussion of whether a government action has um, inf justifiably infringed a right, because often the debate ends up being just about whether the right exists in the first place. And so this uh, approach to Aboriginal rights in the courts has really done little to incentivize governments to be proactive. And, and so they, they just wait until the court says, yes, there is a right. Um, and, and even then, as I mentioned earlier, often there's little done to actually uh, implement the right after the fact, at least on a legislative scale. And sometimes not even, not even the executive governments really move to do much in terms of recognizing rights that have been affirmed by the courts. So why is this all a problem? Um, so, yeah, uh, there have been, um, and I think more and more writings, uh, just laying out the fact that this is a problem from the view of rule of law and constitutionalism. And I gave you my definition earlier of constitutionalism, which I believe is consistent with what the Supreme Court said also in secession reference. Um, in secession reference, the court also talked about the, the rule of law, and we know that the rule of law has a very sort of nuanced um, meaning, but one of the ways that the court has clearly recognized its meaning uh, comes from the Manitoba language reference case, where rule of law involves a positive set of rules um, to which governments are held accountable. So, so written rules uh, upon which we can hold uh, the government uh, to account. When it comes to indigenous issues, um, Aboriginal rights, but also in a, in, a, in a variety of other areas, which under our court's definition of what is Aboriginal rights don't count as Aboriginal rights, such as service areas like child welfare, uh, in, income assistance, um, housing, um, there is no legislation either. And in fact, in various reports, the Auditor General of Canada has linked this uh, problem of lack of legislation with the rule of law. And Jana Promislow and I write about this uh, significantly in some of the work we've done. Uh, John Burroughs has as well. And so there, you know, from the viewpoint of some very important uh, uh, fundamental principles that are part of our constitutional order, we're not meeting that when it comes to Indigenous issues. Um, but so at, at a principle level, it's a problem, but at a practical level, it is very much a problem as well. So as I've said earlier, uh, most of what we see happen happens at the executive level. And therefore, when things happen through policy or agreements, a lot of it is, you know, uh, we have a significant discretion of executive actors. Um, and, uh, and often that discretion uh, benefits and favors the government parties uh, with little or no accountability and very little oversight of the actions of uh, the executive. Um, so to go back to some of the policies that I had mentioned earlier, the comprehensive land claims policy, as well as the inherent rights policy, the government of Canada has essentially said, this is what we will do in order to, uh, to recognize either your land claim or your right to self-government. Uh, they set 
the, the terms under which they will negotiate, when and how, who else has to be involved. They usually stipulate that the province has to be involved. If the province doesn't want to be involved, you might not be able to negotiate. Uh, they set out what are the, the, the terms they're willing to negotiate and which they are not and how. And so Canada holds all the cards in uh, under a lot of these policies. And in fact, there is really no way to challenge that. If Canada will not play ball with you because you're not meeting some part of the policy, and sometimes even Canada has interpreted its policy where somebody might apply, but they say they don't, or might be eligible under the policy, they still say you're not. So there's been lots of foot dragging under a lot of these. There is no way to hold the government often accountable for, um, for not implementing its... Uh, um, uh, its policies as it should. Another area I will just touch on is I think that the lack of legislative implementation and actually going to set out somewhere where a right has been recognized. Let's go back to my uh, example of Sapir and Pulte's, uh, the right to uh, harvest timber domestically. There is nowhere where it is set out what uh, Mi'kmaq in the province uh, and Maliseet uh, can do to exercise their rights. You know, they have to go read the Marshall decision or, you know, go see a lawyer or, or go read the decision to determine what it is their, their, their rights are. Um, and so I, I do think there's a, a whole lot of confusion that is created when there's no implementation that happens through legislation. And, you know, it could it could happen through an agreement as well. But again, I think it, that also often creates a lot of discretion. And there has been a ton of confusion even after um cases have found that there are established rights. Um, and we see this uh, after cases have been decided where um, you have perhaps some policy that has been um, adopted by a natural resource department of a, a province, and they're taking a different interpretation of what the court decision said. Um, they're taking a more narrow approach. And so, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Often these decisions are not made public. And so, you know, from the idea of rule of law of policy or of, of laws being set out in a, in a positive way and so that citizens can actually know their rights, but also how to hold government accountable, that is lacking. Um, yeah, and I think my, my last point here is that this, this jurisdictional neglect does cause harm to Indigenous peoples. I mean, I think nowhere have we seen that and, and Canadians are starting to understand this better when it comes to the child welfare context. And we have a human rights decision uh, from 2016 that essentially said, you know, the lack of government um, uh, uh, attention to these issues and, and ongoing systemic chronic underfunding essentially made the child welfare system into the new residential schools. Um, and so, I mean, there, there is harm in these ways. And, you know, in over the past 30 years, um, there hasn't been like a huge up, upswing in Indigenous people's well-being. There are still huge socioeconomic issues, despite Section 35 having been recognized. And so in 2014, the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Issues said that Canada had reached a crisis point in terms of the socioeconomic situations of First Nations. And it's not to say that, um, you know, there hasn't been some movement, but with executive policies and discretion and agreements that are sort of one-offs, um, what we sort of see is this sort of survival of the fittest when it comes to Indigenous peoples um, benefiting from their rights. So it's those who have the resources and the capacity or who are savvy enough to negotiate agreements or deals or push through with litigation that are getting the benefits of some of these policies. But then those who can't, for a variety of reasons, many of them related to colonialism, um, are not benefiting. And I think that's a real problem. So um, I have got my last couple of slides here and my questions. So what are the potential barriers to achieving a sort of culture of uh, legislative reconciliation? I mentioned and, and you know, governments often use as an excuse that the division of powers is, is a problem. Both governments saying it's the other one who is responsible. I mean, the fact is that the Supreme Court of Canada's um, uh, decisions, uh, division of powers decisions over Indigenous issues over the past 30, 40 years have essentially recognized really broad overlapping jurisdiction. And some of that is controversial. John Burroughs, um, Josh, uh, Joshua Nichols write about, you know, the need to return to an earlier relationship where 
um, the federal government protects Indigenous peoples from encroachment from the provinces. But the Supreme Court's approach has to find uh, has been to find that Canada has um, that provinces have a significant legislative uh, powers as well with respect to Indigenous people. In Kincatla, they said that you know provincial legislation that actually um, references or deals with Indigenous issues, which used to be called singling out, they said it. Uh, you know, in many cases, that will not be a constitutional problem so long as what the province is trying to do is either ameliorate the position of Indigenous peoples within the province and it's within their jurisdiction, um, uh, or, um, you know, achieving a balance between the rights of Indigenous peoples and other peoples in the province. In the Chilcotin and Grassy Narrows case, um, the court also said, you know, when it comes to Section 35 rights, both the provinces and the federal government have obligations and um, did away with the idea that Aboriginal rights go to the core of the federal power over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And so that decision, again, and it is controversial, some scholars really don't like that decision, um, it provided a lot of room um, for, you know, people don't like it because it provides a lot of room for governments to infringe. I guess the converse of that is that it also provides a lot of room for provincial governments to accommodate and respect. But we just don't have a culture for that, and that is uh, one of the major issues here. It is a potential opportunity if there are ways to ensure that, you know, we, we have a culture where provinces see themselves as respecting and accommodating Indigenous rights. Um, this, uh, this uh, I will deal with this one too long. The, the status quo is now part of our architecture. So this was Quebec's argument in the, in the C92 uh, reference, but uh, arguing that because we have not had a culture of recognizing Aboriginal rights and legislation, it's too late to start it now. It's part of our constitutional architecture. I, I really don't buy that. I don't think you can suggest that legislative neglect, what, which is, you know, harmed um, thousands upon thousands of Indigenous people has become, you know, one of these things that we value or laud as part of our architecture, like the Supreme Court or uh, unwritten constitutional principles. I think that's... Um, baloney <laughs> for lack of a better word um so i'm not and we'll see how the supreme court addresses that but uh it seems to me that that's not a real a, a real concern um i think the next two raise i think important issues that come up which is indigenous resistance and distrust to legislation and i can you know i that is an understandable concern um, you know, for over a hundred years, uh, um, the only legislation that Indigenous people have known is the Indian Act, or most Indigenous people, First Nations people have known is the Indian Act, and that has only been used to exploit and harm for the most part. So you can you can anticipate that Indigenous people will rightly be concerned or worried when you start talking about new legislation that that's going to be the it's going to be repeating those same problems of the past. So. There's some legitimate fears uh, there, um, and uh, and and I think also it was interesting. I was reading an article by Mary Ellen Turpel about um, the Charlottetown Accord and how even at the time uh, putting in um, putting in uh, provisions in the Charlottetown Accord to recognize self-government, there was some pockets of Indigenous people who resisted and pushed back against that as well. And, uh, you know, that can be concerns that they might be watering down um, treaty rights or domesticating treaty rights. And we saw a lot of the same debate. There were pockets of Indigenous people who were uh, concerned about um, uh, the UN Declaration Act that Canada passed last summer. And so there, there are real issues there. And, and I think... I don't think there's any real getting around them except sort of realizing that Indigenous people are not monolithic. We don't have just one point of view on, on these things and people will, uh, with legitimate reasons, sometimes disagree. Um, but that there uh, are, there can be um, some real benefits to having um, uh, legislation that is not about uh, limiting Indigenous people's rights, but limiting what governments can do to Indigenous people with respect to their rights. So actually setting out those parameters in law so that everyone is aware of them. So I think mean, part of it is sort of getting out the message that the way that legislation has been used in the past is not necessarily the way that it can be used in the future. Um, 
Yeah, and, and I guess, uh, you know, some people uh, argue quite strenuously that it, it's better to have negotiations with, uh, with governments, and that's more on the nation-to-nation -nation level. And I mean, I think that negotiations are never going to go away. There will always have to be negotiations. But I, I, going back to my points about the inherent rights policy and the, um, and the modern land claims policy, the comprehensive land claims policy, all of that now is just policy and it'll just give so much discretion. If there was legislation that was actually setting out the parameters of, um, uh, in which uh, legislation, um, sorry, negotiations could happen in a way that are fair, that doesn't give Canada um, or go other governments the upper hand, that really tries to balance the, um, uh, the power imbalance, that would be really important. So it's not as though you're doing away with negotiations. In fact, you can find ways to, ma to make the playing field far more balanced, um, I think, with, with legislation. Um, the last point I'll deal with here is sort of this idea uh, around co um, the need for co-development consent. And I underlined this at the beginning, that uh, when it comes to legislation, this cannot be unilateral. And um, there is a need for a discussing, uh, for figuring out ways to develop this legislation and working in partnership with Indigenous people. And for some people, this concept makes their brain explode because they go to this place of saying, well, there's like over 600 Indigenous groups in Canada. How could we possibly accommodate or discuss, you know, issues with all of them? And I, I usually say, let's take a step back on that one. Um, you know, the, the, it really depends about the issue and that if you're dealing with a matter within a province, for example, in Nova Scotia, there are 13 Mi'kmaq uh, communities, First Nations communities, and uh, you would start by talking to the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq chiefs since they uh, generally work together to address issues. And, and so it really depends on the, on the matter. And um, there are also ways that other countries have, have worked through this. Uh, for example, uh, you know, um, there's a, the Sami Parliament um, and the Royal Commission report on Aboriginal peoples also spoke about the need for uh, having an Aboriginal Parliament that would be the, the, the body that parliamentarians would speak with when um, designing legislation for Indigenous peoples. So there are ideas there. And going back to my example of the U.S., um, clearly something is working there. From John uh, Burroughs' article on this, it seems that Congress has found a way to work with all the various tribes in the U.S. in passing legislation um, that they are, they are consenting to. So there are, I think, ways to deal with some of these potential barriers. So in my last slide, and I know, Hadley, I'm a little over, but I, we'll have a few minutes. But I just want to talk briefly on some of these, what I think are some of the best pathways forward. Um, you know, building on the um, what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said about, uh, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples being the framework, should be the framework for reconciliation. This has been something that uh, the federal government, the government of British Columbia have been working on. Uh, they've both passed legislation uh, recognizing um, the UN Declaration and its application uh, in Canadian law. I have another article where I've sort of unpacked some of this, but there are ways that the UN Declaration really helps address some of the problems that were mentioned earlier. Uh, one is that it emphasizes that the rights of Indigenous peoples are fundamental human rights. And the, and the Canadian legislation um, recognizing the UN Declaration emphasizes that point as well. So hopefully that will be something that can undo what the Vanderpeet um, case really sort of entrenched for a, a while, which is this idea that Indigenous rights are not uh, are, are not fundamental rights, not fundamental human rights. UNDRA presents these as uh, generic rights that all Indigenous people across the world have a right to. And I so I hopefully that will have an impact on the development of our law and changing that viewpoint. To the same extent, you know, the, the declaration includes 46 articles with various sub-articles uh, that, that are fairly comprehensive in listing what are the rights of Indigenous peoples. And so, um, in some ways, it fills the box. You know, the, this idea that Section 35 was an empty box, the UN Declaration has the promise to really fill that box. And beyond that, not only just enumerating what the rights of Indigenous peoples are, it goes to uh, significant length to describe what are the obligations of governments uh, 
with respect to those rights, saying when they have particular obligations and sometimes special obligations to implement these rights. And there's a very big emphasis throughout the um, throughout the declaration that government implementation including through legislation is really important and um, the um, the legislation in Canada that has recognized the UN declaration also emphasizes this and so um, section 5 of the new federal law says that Canada in consultation and cooperation with indigenous people has to take all me measures necessary to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration um, so um, that I think will go a long way to addressing some of the problems that I have discussed. Uh, to just touch finally on a sort of, I think other areas where it would be extremely helpful uh, to kind of help us get to this culture of, of legislative recognition uh, would be um, our courts being a bit uh, more brave, judicial courage I call it, in, in helping to uh, achieve this end. Um, I think one way would be to give more attention to what are effective remedies in Aboriginal rights cases. I think this is an area that is uh, largely overlooked. And um, often our courts, uh, in, in the cases that have gone before the courts in Section 35, usually a constitutional exemption is granted. Um, however, in the charter context, the court has uh, expressed serious reservations about using something like a constitutional uh, exemption because it fails to give Parliament the opportunity or guidance on how to fix the constitutional problem. And, and so I, I, I see that there's a real benefit for, um, you know, our courts uh, being stronger on remedies. And, you know, yes, maybe it sounds strange to say, oh, this violates Aboriginal rights, I'm going to strike down the entire legislation. But maybe that's what we need to see happen in order to strengthen these rights. But also remember there are other tools available. There are temporary suspensions of invalidity. So a court could say it is invalid because it fails to respect Aboriginal rights, but I will give the government a year uh, to, um, to, to address this. You know, and we see in Manitoba language reference a temporary suspension of invalidity for uh, several years in order to correct the constitutional problem there. I also think there's a real big need uh, for courts to use remedies such as structural injunctions. I was reading about a case uh, from the US uh, that involved treaty fishing rights and a court has had, um, uh, has been case managing the case for over 50 years and it's ongoing, but it, it has tried to manage a fisheries right between the state, the federal government and the, the tribal beneficiaries. And so uh, this has been something that the courts have been a really light touch on, and I think it's time to really re-examine that. And we've seen with the Canadian human rights case um, that the, you know, the, the tribunal has um, remained seized of the child welfare matter for over six years, and it's really important for matters of accountability. Lastly, I'm still thinking this one through. I think the concept of Jordan's principle, um, which uh, uh, is about, you know, preventing um, jurisdictional disputes between federal and provincial governments from causing harm to indigenous people. I think this concept um, can, can be used to be taken further than it has been so far as a constitutional uh, concept uh, to help us figure out how um, uh, that responsibility piece uh, of power and jurisdiction that the federal governments have with respect to indigenous people. So I, I leave it there. Uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time for a few questions. Sorry, Hadley. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Naomi, um, for, for as usual, um, on, on illuminating um, and, and uh, an interesting um, overview, and then also um, pointing us towards possible solutions. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, a couple related questions, um, and I think they go around that division of powers in Jordan's principle. So maybe I'll, I'll pose the one, and then um, if we have a chance, um, the other side of that. So um, one of the questions um, is around Quebec's argument um, in the C92 reference, um, where they are saying um, the issue is actually that the federal government shouldn't be able to unilaterally um, define these rights in legislation um, or define the content of the constitution more generally. So um, comment on that um, and then flip to that Jordan's principle. 
Sure. Um, yeah, because I, I see the two as being very much um, uh, related uh, to each other. Um, so, I mean, it's a question of the extent to which uh, Section 9124 allows the federal government to address longstanding harm that jurisdictional neglect and wrangling has caused. So it seems to me that if we value these principles of reconciliation and uh, atoning for the, the harms of the past and also Indigenous people's rights to equality, which is so much embedded in, in um, the Caring Society case, that um, you know, these, these add to that 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 conversation or that nuance around what is you know Canada's responsibility. I think for just too long we've seen it simply as being about power, about the federal power to you know to to legislate over Indigenous people um, and, and and the provinces as well too. I mean that got really expanded in Chilcot and Grassy Narrows. Um, so yes, that is a, a question at the heart of it, but. You know, as part of this, too, I often say, well, the provinces have never wanted this jurisdiction, at least not to exercise it as it relates to protecting Aboriginal rights for the most part. It's just there have only been very minimal efforts at this. And I think it's a culture we need to get to. Um, but um, I, I think that the, you know, the, the way that the Court of Appeal resolved the issue, um, they did see that the federal power over Section 91 is quite broad. The only problem that they identified was that the provisions around paramountcy that were included in the act were problematic um, as it relates to the, the, the province, that the, 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 that the scheme for paramountcy ought to be determined through Section 35, and that gives a bit more opportunity. It gives opportunity to the province to argue a justified infringement, but even then the court suggested it would be extremely difficult. And, you know, some of us are quite, you know, wanting to to see the feds having that power to be able to put in uh, paramountcy rules. And I think a lot of it has to do with that that history uh, of neglect. And I think this is where the Jordan's principle concept can come in as well. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm really answering the question. I, I know that that is the question at the heart of it. But I think that the approach that we've taken in the past, the very doctrinal one that's more focused on power as opposed to responsibility and reconciliation. I think we need to shift our thinking on that. And, and that's kind of what I'm getting at with this whole legislative reconciliation idea. Yeah. Thank you um, for that, Naomi. And I think I think that goes into, um, you, you raise this idea of having Jordan's principle um, take on a constitutional dimension or, or be a constitutional principle. And I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit further to that um, and, and where you see that coming in to, to address some of these issues. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying to flesh some of this out. I mean, at its basis, the pro, you know, Jordan's principle came from a uh, resolution of parliament about, um, you know, it was a, a jurisdictional dispute between Manitoba and Canada that led to an Indigenous young man never being able to move home to his family before he died because he was in hospital and quite ill and, uh, you know, neither government would pay. And so the, uh, for, they disputed who would have to pay for the services for him to return home. So he never got to. And so the principle itself was initially uh, accepted by parliamentarians as this idea that government uh, skirmishes should not cause harm or delay or denial of rights. And then this gets get picked up on by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal as, as a human rights principle. And in the Quebec Court of Appeal decision, they also said they, they, they re-emphasized this. Um, and I think Colleen Shepard has written on this as well, that it, it is it is taken on sort of a life as a sort of a quality and, and jurisdictional division of power sort of question about uh, or, or principle. And I think there's more fleshing out of it to do because it does tell us that skirmishes should not allow um, Indigenous people's rights to be delayed or denied. So that's the starting principle. But we haven't fully fleshed out the sort of rest of it. Well, OK, but then who has who has the responsibility than uh, to pay, like, uh, you know, between the two, who, how do we figure that question out? And there's such overlapping jurisdiction, but then with the federal government, we have, you know, the, the long history of a treaty nation to nation relationship and fiduciary duty. The courts have said the provinces have that as well. But what I've been sort of thinking about is sort of what, what further principles can we bring into that to sort of resolve these questions so that Jordan's principles also tells us what is it the feds can do legislatively 
uh, perhaps when uh, provinces are dragging their feet or doing nothing? Or can they do things like uh, create paramountcy rules such that, it, yes, it, it removes the ability of the of the province to say, in this particular case, we are, our laws will be paramount, um, but it, because it actually protects uh, Indigenous rights, it achieves reconciliation and perhaps some of the values in the UN Declaration. So these are sort of the things that I'm grappling with, but I think we need we need to fill in that sort of remaining uh, sort of piece of thinking through Jordan's principle about what does it tell us about government responsibility? Thank you for that, Naomi. Um, I don't I don't think we have any further questions um, from from the audience at this point. Um, so maybe I, I, I think if we were live, I would invite everybody to join me and thanking you um, one. Oh, one more question. Hang on. Um, we'll just give a minute. We have the, the technological delay, so I can't see until it shows up. <laughs> Perhaps the Jeopardy theme music should be playing yeah. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just waiting for the waiting for the one more question. <laughs> Although we are at time, though, maybe uh, also Zara, we could, uh, um, you know, if people want to send direct questions to me. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, so, so how? So, so the question is, um, how how might negotiating a new rights and implementation recommendation framework provide tools that are not already available to address self determination, land and resource, crown First Nation relations? Oh, that's a that's an enormous question, and there was efforts, and they and they were um, you recall back in 2018, 2019, there was a period of time when um, Minister Bennett was going around and having these discussions. But what came out of that were fairly weak and watered down sort of proposals about what rights recognition would look like. There's a really interesting proposal in uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and I have a paper where I said maybe it's a matter of revisiting that. Although since I've written that too, I, I've, I've heard some of the critiques about what, you know, some of the concerns being that you, you're setting up a system still where it's the government of Canada gatekeeping who can exercise self-government or not. And so I think that there are sort of some issues or challenges are, around that. Um, but a, a good place to at least to sort of start having a conversation about what it might look like is the, the Royal Commission's um, uh, uh, proposal. Um, I've got a, yeah, like I say, you can find a paper of mine on discussing some of that, but I think that there's 20, 30 years later, there's, there's more that needs to be discussed about what that should look like if that, so such a model would, would, would be appropriate. Thanks. And, and another question, um, and I think we have time, um, for this one, uh, we can go a little bit over here. Um, is just uh, someone saying a great point about that flip side of the expansion of provincial power in Chilcotin and Grassy mm -hmm. Narrows. Um, so in addition to expanding potential infringement, it expands responsibility too. Can you talk a little more about this and, and specifically the person is thinking about Siki? I don't know what that last part of this, uh, that means, but I, I, you know, I, it goes to, I mean, um, yes, there's infringement, um, but yeah, so there's this flip side of it, but we've really not really explored, which is uh, this idea of provincial responsibility. And I think it's getting back to those sort of concepts I was thinking around Jordan's principle um, that emphasizes more responsibility than power simply when we're talking about constitutional questions. Um, and uh, yeah, we have to move from a parent away from this paradigm. If it's just the provinces can do, you know, are, are, are limited only our, our concept of thinking around section 35 and justification too, I think have to um, have to be responsive. And I think we need to bring in a perspective that is informed by reconciliation and the harm that, you know, the, the, the approaches of the past have really, uh, have uh, wreaked havoc on Indigenous people's lives. And as part of all this, we need to also be recognizing Indigenous self-determination and how those things um, align as well. So um, I don't have all the answers to this, but these are all the ideas that I am very much sort of thinking about. And I, I think that 
we can't ignore the role of the provinces, but we need to be thinking about what what are the circumstances in which provinces will start to be more responsive to the real needs of Indigenous people. Thanks for that, um, Naomi. And I see it was cut off. I wasn't sure what Seeky is either, but it was seeking consent. But I think you spoke to it. Um, yeah. So, so we'll we'll bring this to a close. And again, thank you very much um, for your presentation and for those answers to the questions. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>